Good morning. I trust that you're not chasing wind today, but that your pursuit is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we look at the book of Jude, that's really what it's about. There's a lot of people in the name of religion that are chasing the wind. The world is filled with that. And even some that are in violence and angry and hurting and killing other people and burning things down, chasing the wind, because without Christ, it is all but nothing. It is nothing. It has no value. Now, Christ said that he would build his church, and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And I remind you of that because he has also determined not only the end that he would indeed build his church, but he has determined the means. And if you're in Christ today, you're part of that means. You have a responsibility, and I have a responsibility, to stand on the rock, to stand on the truth, and to be a part of building the church of Jesus Christ, a church that will truly honor him and is built upon his word. I almost this morning, I'm with Roger, he he had the the urgings to get up and sing a song. I'm just almost ready to sing uh, the little children's hymn, Uh, the wise man and the foolish man, you know, because the rain coming down and the floods came up, you know, fits the setting today. But that song closes, of course, with the fact that we must be built on the rock. And that rock, of course, is Jesus Christ. Well, that's what this is all about. And I remind you that Jude wanted to teach something else, but the Holy Spirit moved him to teach about those that had been foreordained to come into the church. They did so secretly, stealthily, invade the church. They look like Christians and they use Christian terminology, but they're not of Christ. And they are there to destroy. And Jude is warning us of that. That is very prominent, no question about it, in the history of the church and certainly today. As we look around us, as many churches, even denominations, have rotted from within. Because those that were supposed to be watching fell asleep. And were not taking care of the church of the living God, which we are to be about. And so that's where we are, and we're looking at a description that began in Jude 8 that I've called Meet the Apostates, and now we're in number four of that, and the message is, and I'm going to try to move a little faster today, if that's possible for me, but uh, we're going to look at verses 13 through 16 in this section. I think it's an important section, and let's ask God's mercy again on our time of study, please. Father, we ask you to move in our hearts and in our minds. Move upon us, Father, as we look at your word and remind us of who we are and what we're to be about. Help me, Father, to be able to speak and to do justice to your holy and precious word through Jude that we might be warned that we might be sober and vigilant in the things of Christ, that we might truly be about your business on this day. I beseech you, Father, that you would even use these things which we might think of as negative to build us up in the most holy faith and to make our commitment to thee firm in the things of the Lord Jesus Christ, which are the only things that really matter. And so we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I've already mentioned that our role, or the role, and we think particularly of the leaders of the church, that's the purpose of elders and deacons, is that, that uh, these are, are men that are selected and they're, and they're purposely driven by the description of them and the precious word of God and the qualifications for them to lead the church and to keep the church on target, as it were, 
moving in a way that is pleasing to God. And they are to protect the church from evil because the church, as we have often stated, uh, the purpose of the church is to bear the standard of the word of God. It is a protector, it is a steward of the truth of God in all generations. And we want to, as leaders, keep the distractions, as it were, to a minimum. We often meet about a lot of mundane things and sometimes messy things and other things and beat them around for hours and, and, and so forth. And, and one of the reasons that we do that is so that when we come together in the assembly and, and for worship that we can not have all those things as distractions to us, but that we can focus on the purity of Jesus Christ and focus on Him. That's exceedingly important. Our focus is not on all the things that can get us tripped up in the world and confused, but is upon Christ. Now, everyone has that responsibility in the church. Whether you're a leader or not, you're part and parcel of that. And you're a leader, perhaps, of your family, or you're involved in that with your children and all of that. And the children here are the same way. We're to be wise in the things of God. We're to study to show ourselves approved. Workmen that need not to be ashamed. I know in, in my personal history as a young man and I, as I observed my own dad a wrestle over the things and issues of the church, being a leader in the church, and finally there even came a time in which he felt the necessity to leave certain churches because they had gone the wrong direction. Those were hard decisions. And I've had to face some of those same decisions in my life as an adult. Very difficult decisions. Bone-crunching decisions. And you, as an individual, as you're choosing a church, as you're, as you're aligning yourself with a leadership in a church and a ministry, all those things are exceedingly important to you. And may I say that you and I are going to be held accountable for those things before God. For what we have done in our time on the earth. And to some degree, everything and every person in the church is either part of the problem or part of the solution. Did you ever think about that? Your ministry is to be a ministry to encourage in the things of Christ. Very, very important. Okay, beginning, and we're just jumping in here because we have Jude giving a description that we have called the metaphorical nature pictures that he is using of what apostates look like that infiltrated the church and, and to, to, that we might understand how detrimental they are to the church. Now, beginning in verse 13, well, we've already looked at, by the way, that in verse 12, they were self-seeking, they were superficial, and they were spiritually valueless. They are not contributing anything. They are taking away. In verse 13, he calls them wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wild waves of the sea. We think of Isaiah 57 verse 20 where the wicked are like the troubled sea. And if you've been to the ocean, you know how it just continually the waves are coming in. They never stop. There's no rest for that. They make a lot of noise and they, they stir up things. Uh, and, they, uh, and the ocean, of course, is, is beautiful from a, from a distance in particular. But what is the outcome if you get up early in the morning and walk the shores of the ocean, you'll see all this junk that has been cast up. Here he calls it casting up shame. Although it appears to be doing something significant and beautiful, what it's producing is shame, Greek word ahiskonai, which means disgrace or dishonesty. And of course that is the same thing that Satan produces. He is the father of lies, John 8, 44. He speaks a lie. 
And so Christ stated, you're of your father, the devil. And here are these individuals that really all they're doing is creating a foamy mess. And of course, foam is something that has no value to it. It's like we just talked about the vanity of the air and you tried to grab. Foam is the same way. These, in other words, have no substance, they have no life, they stir up religion, they have a pretense, the, they have manufactured results that are sterile and worthless, they fill time and they make noise, but they're of no value. I don't know if you've been up and down the Christian channels lately, thank goodness there are still some good Christian teachers on those channels, you've got to be selective. But boy, there's a lot of foam and a lot of noise and a lot of mess on there that'll just basically hurt your ears. And, you, and, you, and, and yet, I see with many of those ministries, you'll see these massive auditoriums that are full of people, and you think, what in the world are these people doing there listening to that junk? Because that's what it is. I'm very opinionated, you know. But the point is when spiritual life and thereby understanding of truth does not exist, froth takes its place. Shame replaces truth. Functioning fal falsely, froth provides a deceptive confidence that fills the void of true knowledge of Christ that changes and transforms the heart. So these are waves of the sea casting up their own shame like foam. And then he also calls them wandering stars. Wandering stars. I've uh, been out at night and uh, the privilege of living out in the country, you can see the stars quite nicely and it's a blessing to do that. But you know that there's a whole theology given to us in the illustration of light versus darkness and of course, Christ said that I am the light of the world. And so this light that he is speaking of, of course, is that which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. It guides us. It leads us to truth and righteousness and, and the true and the living God, the, the, the God of glory. It guides to our Lord, pointing to him like stars that produce light. Now, fixed stars, fixed in the universe, and they are, are used by seagoing vessels to guide those vessels in the right direction so they won't be lost. And the fixed doctrines of the church in the Word of God, like the, these stars, fixed our, fix our faith, make our faith absolutely sure, and lead us in the ways of God, and they lead us and point us to Christ. But what about these stars? These are wandering stars, or I've called them here spurts because I was looking for an S, but uh, they are. They're just a spurt. If you've, if you've seen a, a wandering star, he's talking about what we call a shooting star or a meteor, and you can be out, and all of a sudden you'll see one uh, go across the sky like that. Now, he's saying that these apostates look like stars that would be fixed there for our guidance but instead they're not and you see it would not be possible for a mariner someone guiding a ship a navigator to fix their compass upon a shooting star even if you could do such a thing they don't last long enough but even if you could because why they're aimless they're directionless, they're quickly burned out, they move into the darkness. So, in other words, Jude is saying, if you follow a spurt, a shooting star, what would you have? Nothing. Nothing at all. You invest your eternal relationship with God in a shooting star, a short-lived false star that burns out and you have absolutely nothing. That is the picture that he has drawn for us. Now there's a little short story that I've recommended to you before if you've never read it. You can find it online. It's called The Celestial Railroad. 
and it's a sequel to John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, where Pilgrim is leaving the city of destruction and taking the narrow path, as Christ speaks of in Matthew chapter 7, and he's going through the narrow gate, and it's a, it, it's a difficult way, but God is with him all the way to the celestial city. Well, Nathaniel Hawthorne came along later and wrote a sequel to that. He calls the Celestial Railroad, in which some wiser individuals of his time had come in and built a nice modern railroad that would just pass all this old hard, narrow path that Pilgrim had to walk with that big old sack on his back, which of course was the burden of his sins that he lost at the cross. We don't need all that stuff. We've got a new modern railroad that'll take us right to the celestial city. So I want to read you a little piece of that, whet your appetite. Now, as an allegory, when it gives a name of person in the allegory, it's naming what their character is. And so here's Mr. Smooth It Away speaking to really the writer here who would really be Mr. Gullible, and he's speaking to this writer. And he says, don't you know Apollyon, Christian's old enemy with whom he fought so fierce a battle in the Valley of Humiliation? He was the very fellow to manage the engine of this new train. And so we have reconciled him to the custom of going on pilgrimage and engaged him as the chief engineer. Now, please think with me about what he's saying here. And this gullible one says, bravo, bravo. With irresistible enthusiasm, this shows the liberality of the age. This proves, if anything, that all that musty prejudice that has gone on in the past in a, are in a fair way to be obliterated. And how will Christian rejoice to hear of this happy transformation of this old antagonist I promise myself great pleasure in informing him of it when we reach the celestial city. So the passengers being all comfortably seated, we now rattled away merrily, accomplishing a great distance in 10 minutes, more than Christian probably trudged over in a day. It was laughable while we glanced along, as it were, at the tail of a thunderbolt to observe two dusty foot travelers in the old pilgrim guise with cockle shell and staff their mystic rolls of parchment in their hands and their intolerable burdens on their backs, the preposterous obstinacy of these honest people in persisting to groan and stumble along the difficult pathway rather than take advantage of our modern improvements. Of course, when you get to the end of this thing, they didn't arrive at the celestial city. They arrived at the gates of hell. And that's the point that is being made here in our passage, even when Jude says, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. This black darkness ultimately is what is reserved for apostates and for all who follow them. Because, dear friend, this is not a laughing or casual matter. It's not just a matter of someone's opinion and, well, you think this and I think that. And this is my way to get to glory. This is my way of worshiping God. You have your thing and I have my thing. No, I, there is only one thing. There's only one road. There's only one Lord, one faith. And we must be in conformity to him. Now in beginning in verse 14, Jude takes a little bit of a turn here, and he says, it was also about these men, these apostates that have crept in unnoticed into the church, that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam, who is Enoch? Well, he was one of the most godly men mentioned in the Bible. If we went, took the time to go back to Genesis chapter 5, Around verse 18, we would see that Enoch, it says, very simply, that he walked with God. 
And that little phrase that he walked with God is so rich with meaning that you know, we could do six un, uh, sermons on that easily and probably not hit the bottom of it. Because let me just say, that's what every one of us should be doing. Walking with God in that sense. It means that he was abiding with, he was in harmony with, and I think at that time he was literally walking with the pre-incarnate Christ. They were friends. They were of one mind and one heart. In fact, they were in so much in that sense that it says God took him. <laughs> He's just walking along with God. So the Lord just took him right on into glory. Hallelujah. There's the first rapture right there. Well, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Have you ever really walked with God? I, I trust everyone here has, but you're, you're in His Word, and you're in prayer, and you're in devotion to Him, and your heart is so stirred, and you know your feet are just about this far above the ground, and you just feel like, I don't care about what's going on in the world. I don't care about all this stuff. I'm walking with God. And you feel as though God could just take you into glory right there. Hallelujah. That's what he's referring to here. But here's Enoch, this godly man. And it says, he prophesied way back at the beginning, seventh generation from Adam about these same individuals that were going to challenge the work of God. And he says here, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones. Came here is in the aorist punctiliar action in Hebrew, and it has with it what is called a prophetic past tense. And it's always used in Scripture when something is so sure in the mind of God that it's as good as done. So although it was 6,000 years ago, it was as good as done that God would come someday, it says here, with, his, with many thousands of his holy ones. The holy ones in Matthew 25, 31, when it speaks of this event of the second coming of Christ, is spoken of as angels. But in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4, it is spoken of as the redeemed of Christ. And so the idea here is that both are coming. It's a fact of Scripture. Christ is going to return. Now, what is the point that Jude is making here concerning this? And by the way, there's a bunch of dialogue about where this is quoted from, an apocryphal book, and so forth and so on. That doesn't matter. The fact that it is included here is the fact that it is true and righteous, and Jude knew that, and that's why it's pinned here. Now, the, the point is that the truth of Christ's return for judgment, and particularly with a focus on those that are in opposition to the Lord, should drive our seriousness and our concern in our day to do God's will and not be affected by apostasy. To live faithfully for Him. There's no neutral ground here. There's no easy chair, spiritually, that we can sit in. And just kind of let everything blow by and we're riding the celestial railroad in that sense. I hope you see that. So this is a, a throwback to, when you go back to verse 4, where Jude says right off the bat that these are marked out for this condemnation. They're marked out so that Enoch, way back at the beginning, could prophesy that Christ is going to return and he's not going to come like he did the first time he came in humility, but he's going to come in power and great glory and he's going to come with the purpose of judgment. And these, in particular, are in his mind as judgment. Why? Well, it was mentioned this morning, and I mention it again, that the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, says that he was the chief of sinners. 
Now, he wasn't just making that up. C certainly, he was a humble man. But there was truth to that. Why was there truth to that? Because he persecuted the church of the living God. Now, my friend, apostasy is persecuting the church of God. All these characters that are using the word of God as their means of attaining money and fortune and fame and doing all this other stuff selfishly for themselves and could care less about the truth of God are persecutors of the church of Christ. They are destroyers of the church of Christ. And here Jude is saying that God has them marked out in particular for judgment. He's coming with a special emphasis on judgment, on the destruction of those that have sought to tear down the foundations of the church and have done so and have been used of Satan to destroy the truth and turn people's hearts and lives away from the true and the living God and the truth that is so important. Now, brother, we see that in our country. Our foundations have largely been destroyed. And the masses of ignorant people don't even know what Christianity is because of these characters. Now, he goes on to say here, in verse 15, he elaborates, he says, to execute judgment upon all, and the all here is referring to all the unsaved, none will escape, just as the flood destroyed everyone outside of the ark, the judgment of Christ will be upon everyone who is not in Christ. The judgment is not executed on the saints, but actually for the saints, for the righteousness of God. And there won't be any defense that anybody can give and say, now wait a minute. Christ, you're not politically correct. <laughs> Do you think that's going to stand up? Think of Psalm 1. The wicked will not stand in the judgment. Paul talks about in Romans 3 that when, it, when you really understand sin, that every mouth is shut. There's no answer. There's no answer. And so here he says that the ungodly, and this word ungodly is used four times to emphasize the apostates are ungodly. That is, they're irreverent. They don't represent God. They represent the opposite of God. I, I have to get you to turn to a place that is very familiar, but I think it's the most sobering scripture in the, all the Word of God, Matthew chapter 7, look at verse 21. Because this is referring to this same judgment that we're talking about here in Jude when Christ returns. Notice what it says in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who has a big, vibrant ministry with a lot of people making a lot of noise. No. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in, how do they do the will of the Father? They've been changed. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. They've been born from above. They've been given a, a heart of flesh. The heart of stone has been removed. They've been washed in the blood of Christ. And therefore, they have the ability. Christ says, if, if the Son of Man shall set you free, you'll be free indeed. And that's freedom from sin. Freedom to serve the true and the living God. Here's these people that are shocked. They're not only deceiving others, but they're deceived themselves. I says, we did, didn't we prophesy in your name? And 
cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You're not doing what is pleasing to God. And that's why Jude here is saying in this passage, the ungodly, because even though they may be using Christian terms, they may be in churches in leadership, they may be in the pulpit, they may be running around with all kinds of Christian organizations and institutions and saying God this and God that and Lord this, Lord that and all kinds of other cutesies and dootsies, but they are not those that truly know God, nor are they presenting the truth that transforms the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, they are ungodly. And he says here that, that he will convict all the ungodly. That is, that word convict means to expose. Whereas they were hidden reefs in verse 12, they will be exposed. And whereas there were lots of pretenses going on and deception, it'll all be found out, it'll all be cleared the hidden things will be brought to light. And as the Old Testament says in Numbers, be sure your sin will find you out. How foolish to think that you can pretend with God and get away with it. You see, none of these, again, will be able to stand in judgment. And this judgment that God will bring is in two primary areas, their actions and their words. For he goes on to say here, ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way. It should have been obvious to anybody that was truly a saint that what they were doing, if they're in the word of God and have the mind of Christ, that all this hocus pocus junk and froth is not the things of God. God truly saves. He doesn't just... Uh, manufacture a bunch of noise and stuff that tantalizes the tickled ears of individuals. And he says they've done it in an ungodly way, an irreverent way, not presenting God accurately, not treating him with reverence as to who he truly is. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And all he says, these harsh things that he says here, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, which is, again, actions and words. That's where all of us are seen. What do we say with our mouth? What do we do with our life? You can't avoid those two things. You can't say, I can't say, you can't say, well, you know, I, I say one thing, but I don't really mean that. Or I do this with all of my time and all of my energy and all of my effort and all the focus of my life. No, but I really don't mean that. I really, my heart is really over here even though I'm doing this over here. That doesn't make sense, does it? That's why God will judge us for our words and our actions. And he says they're ungodly. Ungodly. All the anti-Bible, anti-God rhetoric it's not innocent. It's blasphemy. And if an individual stands up and set, purports to be a representative of the true and the living God, and he is spewing out froth and foam and poison and junk that is not in conformity to the truth of this precious word, it's ungodly. In fact, it's the highest level of ungodly, again, because it's destructive to the church. It's leading people astray. And that's why Paul could say he was the chief of sinners. And by the way, he was a religious nut. And there's a lot of religious nuts that don't know God, that claim his name. These are ultimately individuals quarreling with their maker, his decrees, his truth, his providence, and his people. They are against him. 
Now Jude wants us to understand the significance to God of these destroyers of the church. They have special condemnation. Those who accept them, align themselves behind them, or attending churches that have become so apostate themselves and they're just continuing there because it's all oh, it's just where I've always been and I'm just comfortable here and I I know that old brother so and so even though he doesn't speak very well he really loves the Lord no he doesn't my friend on the authority of what is said here I can say that now it's not that I'm setting myself up as judge but the Word of God is the judge. You can't just simply say, oh, well, that's just the way things are today in the church. We're riding the celestial railroad. And so it's a warning to us. It's a serious warning in our day. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Now, finally, in verses... In verse 16, he gives their sinister conduct. What can we expect from these that we're talking about? Do they provide something wholesome? Many people think, again, that going to any kind of religion, any kind of church, any whether it's uh, long since gone astray and, uh, or whatever, that it's better than not going anywhere at all. Now, we could probably argue that all day and so forth, but what do we really expect from these individuals? Why? Because their conduct determines the fact that they have not been tr transformed. Well, notice it says, these are grumblers. Would you look back with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 10? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I remind you again, if you look at verse 6, here's, here's Paul saying, These things happened as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also crave. And if we skip down to verse 9, Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. They happened for our example. Would you go back to Numbers chapter 14? Numbers chapter 14. Numbers 14. In verse 2. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Did you ever think about how ridiculous people's grumbling is? And that, I mean, I, I'm guilty too sometimes. The things that we come up with, how, how absolutely absurd. Boy, they were having a good old time in Egypt making bricks seven days a week, weren't they? without straw? Or would that we just died in the wilderness? And, and uh, how ridiculous is that? Grumblers, complaining directly, as it says down in verse 27 of chapter 14. They're, they're, who is their complaining against? How long shall I bear, here's Christ, or God speaking, with this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? Our grumbling is against God. And particularly if that grumbling and complaining is in the church of the living God, who may not be perfect, but is really seeking to represent God, His doctrines, His providence, His people, that grumbling against that is in a special affront Not to me, I don't count. Not to Randy McCulley. No offense, Randy, but you don't count either. <laughs> but it's an offense to God. I hope you see that. Those, 
This grumbling is the idea of those working in the background, stirring up opposition, backstabbing. This is a sin that pulls God off of his throne to receive a scolding from sinful, unappreciative, non-worshipful creatures. Creature moves in contention with God. And with that is the idea here, he says, back in Jude, verse 16, finding fault or discontented, unhappy, speaking out constantly. Uh, the extended definition, of course, is, is, is the fact that it's finding fault. It's inappropriate because there's no fault to be found there. They're just looking around for reasons to complain and grumble and find something wrong so that their nature is destructive. And the idea of grumbling is under the breath, spreading poison, stirring up the brethren. Exactly what was done in Israel. And I remind you that God opened up the ground and swallowed them up. What a horrible thing. What a horrible thing. Now you see this whole matter is an issue of heart. Please look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul deals with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 15. Here's what the apostle who said, follow my example, says. I will most gladly spend and be expended for your souls. If I am put out a little bit, then I'm going to complain. He doesn't say that, does he? If I love you more, am I to love you less? Am I to be loved less? Down in verse 20. For I am afraid that perhaps when I come I may find you to be not what I wish and may be found by you to be not what you wish, that perhaps there will be strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. Is, is, is that what the church of Christ is supposed to be consisting of? A bunch of complaining and grumbling and fault finding? No. It should have the mind of the Apostle Paul. I can be expended for you. I can love you. I, every one of us is love covers a, multitudes of sin, a multitude of sins. You know, James talked about this, that what is the source of quarrels among you? And it was, the answer was hearts focused contrary to God. In fact, now that you're in Corinthians, look back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You can even carry it a step farther. And Where is this mindset gone? Verse, chapter 6, verse 7. Here is Paul dealing with some that have been fussing and fighting among themselves, such that they've even taken it to court. And he says, actually then it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. And he asks the question. Why not rather be wronged? You ever thought about that? You're upset with somebody? So what? When we've been there 10,000 years, do you think that's going to matter? <laughs> we get so hung up on all this little tinky do nothing of stuff, this vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Why not just be defrauded? It's Christ. Speaking of somebody, ask for your coat, give them your cloak also. Turn the other cheek. So what? Have the mind of Christ. I'm just amazed at myself too, for I get off track. But the mindset of the day in which we live couldn't help but think of this little account in the Great Awakening in America back in 1740. And there was an account by a fellow named Nathan Cole that he wrote down, and here was an ignorant farmer, of when George Whitfield was coming through the country preaching. And I want you to think about 
what was important to him as I read this. One morning, all of a sudden, and he, he talks funny here, about 8 or 9 o'clock there came a messenger and said, Mr. Whitfield preached at Hartford and Weathersfield yesterday and is to preach at Middleton this morning at 10 of the o'clock. I was in my field at work. I dropped my tool that I had in my hand and ran home and run through my house and bade my wife get ready quick to go and hear Mr. Whitfield preach at Middleton and run to my pasture for my horse with all my might, fearing that I should be too late to hear him. I brought my horse home and soon mounted and took my wife up and went fast as I could. I thought the horse could bear. And when my horse began to be out of breath, I would get down and put my wife on the saddle and bid her ride as fast as she could and not stop or slack for me except I bade her. And so I would run until I was much out of breath and then my, mount my horse again and I did this several times to favor my horse. We improved every moment to get along as if we were fleeing for our lives, all the while fearing we should be too late to hear the sermon. For we had 12 miles to ride double in little more than an hour. Where is that mindset today? How many of you rode a horse here this morning in the rain? Did you put your wife down off the horse so the horse could catch his breath? <laughs> Were you running along with the horse? My point is, look at the attitude that I think that God blesses. This is the attitude of gratitude, where minor inconveniences and things disappear. But you see, apostasy, by contrast, is nitpicking and complaining about all this little incidental stuff that doesn't matter. In a previous church I was in, there was a family who left over the color of paint in the nursery. And there's been things that like that, of that nature, that have occurred here, at least, if you had people out of sorts. Now, I'm not trying to point anything at anybody. I'm just trying to, to give all of us, including myself, an understanding of what is the righteous kind of attitude and appreciation for the truth and the clinging to it and the fighting for it because it deserves it when our head is on straight. But these apostates come into churches and stir up trouble. Now he says, and I'll quickly, I'm out of time, but I'll quickly cover this in Jude. Back in our passage, he says, they follow after their own lust. It means they're moving in a direction away from God, but it's all about me. It's all about my comfort. It's all about what I enjoy, not what is best for the furtherance of Christ. And it says that they speak arrogantly, literally means overswollen. All these False teachers are arrogant because they're speaking against the truth of God. All these modernists and critics and revisionists and prosperityites and blowhards, they're disregarding, they're distorting, they're abusing God's word, and that's the height of arrogance. And it says that they flatter people for the sake of of gaining an advantage. And the idea is to falsely make much of someone for the purpose of gaining an advantage. Like the film Pilgrim's Progress. Fine family, the Bryant family. Fine family indeed. We all, yes, you're right. We're really special people. Flattery. The Word of God's not really very flattering, is it? When you read it, it really tells us who we are. <laughs> It flatters Christ. When we can't say enough about him. His name is wonderful. But none of us are. I hate to tell you this. I hate to break that news to you. But none of us are. They're like Absalom. I couldn't help but think of him. Remember how he, in 2 Samuel, set out in the gate when he was trying to, and we had the politicians doing that. And he was all prettied up. He's had his hair done just right. And he smelled good, I'm sure. And the people would come by, and he says, 
Oh, I'm just so concerned about you. You're such a precious person. And, and if, oh, if I were king, I would do this and that and the other for you and all this other stuff. Got sucked in. That's what these do. Well, in closing, I want you to go with me to 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 2, again, let's look at the Apostle Paul. Because here is the template of what you and I should be. The leaders in the church, certainly, but also every one of us in our own perspective, family, with neighbors, friends, and each other, and so forth. Paul said in verse 3 of chapter 2, Our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. What was Paul concerned about? The truth in Christ. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, and that's what every one of us who name the name of Christ, we are entrusted with the gospel. Nothing is more precious than that. He says, so we speak not as pleasing men. That's what the apostates do, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech. Remember, that's what the apostates do. As you know, nor with a pretext for greed. They're all about self. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either for, from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority but he goes on to say, but we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. What's Paul saying? We genuinely love you. Nobody takes care of a baby like mom does. Boy, she runs every time there's a whimper or a little bit of runny nose or anything else going on. You know that. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our lives, because you had become very dear to us. How precious is that? We all have a responsibility and an accountability before God to be watchful concerning apostasy to confront it, and if even necessary, to leave the places where that is what has taken over and there's rotting going on. When I'm personally stumbling at times into the trap of bearing some of the same fruit that is here identified in the apostates, my own grumbling, my own fault-finding, my own selfishness begins to take over. I need to repent and get my head on straight in the Word of God. I need to do as Paul has said here. We are to follow Paul's example. And brethren, if we do, the world's going to look on and say, my, how they love one another. They're also going to despise you, <laughs> some of them. But regardless of that, we need to keep on keeping on. And those that God has ordained to come to him, we need to have a place where people find the truth and hearts are transformed and lives are changed to serve the true and the living God because he is coming again. And when he comes, will he find faith on the earth as Christ has said? Let me ask you to bow with me, please. Father, we thank you that your word irons us, it straightens us out, helps us to think righteously, 
Oh, there's nothing like it. May we all have a heart that says, Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation day and night. Embrace it and live, Father, serving you. And where we do fail, come to you and say, Father, forgive me. And help me to be an instrument in your hands for good and not for evil. Bless those churches and places which are preaching and teaching thy truth. Have mercy, Father, on your people. We ask in Jesus' name.